morning. Listening to this show may result in increased levels of inspiration, motivation, and innovation. Side effects can include the immediate urge to take massive action to build a better business and life for yourself and others. You've been warned. Welcome to Influencers Radio with your host, Jack Mize. And welcome back to another episode of Influencers Radio. Uh, You know, technology is kind of a, it's an ironic uh, subject to me because technology seems to be, every time you hear people talk about technology and the advancement of technology, technology is to uh, make our lives easier, to make our lives better, to to help us, uh, you know, I'm not sure, to get more work done or to have to work less. But it seems like with the advances of technology, people are working harder and longer than they ever have. And... They're doing it with less and less human interaction and communication. Uh, that's communication with customers, communication with coworkers. And we're definitely seeing evidence of this having some disastrous results. Uh, for example, I'm sure a lot of people have remember the Wells Fargo uh, incident. Uh, here recently, you know, they've spent millions, maybe billions of dollars on technology, on customer relationship technology, technology to manage accounts, technology to to do a whole lot of things. But guess what? Something got lost in the mix there. Um, you know, the right hand didn't know where the left hand was doing. And that's one of the big dangers of technology. And today, my guest uh, is someone that understands this very very uh, deeply. Uh, He is an author, speaker, entrepreneur. He is the founder and managing partner of C5 Insight, a consulting firm focused on customer and employee engagement project implementation, and has twice been named to the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies. He's also the uh, best-selling author of the book, The Luck Principle, Business Results at the Intersection of People and profits. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. Please welcome to the show, Jeff Abels. Jeff, welcome to Influencers Radio. Hi, Jack. Thanks so much for having me today. Well, I'm glad to have you here because one, you seem to be kind of, I I don't know if neutral is the word, but but usually people are very uh, on the extreme. They're, 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 avid fervor technology 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 or they're almost to the point of being luddites technology is ruining everything and you you seem to be one that realizes there is a happy uh mix to advance us but uh, there's some things that definitely need to be uh addressed as we do it so let's start right there you're going to talk to us today in words that we can understand right (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I'm all about is kind of taking this subject that can be very complicated and technical and bringing it down to the bottom shelf so everyone from an executive to an entry level employee can really approach this and understand how do we how do we use technology to embrace timeless relationship and people principles rather than just technology for technology's sake. You know, th- that phrase right there that you just said technology for technology's sake. I'm sure that anyone that works in any kind of corporate environment has seen that phenomenon occur where, you know, thousands or I should say millions of dollars are spent on these huge um, systems that are meant to, you know, make things easier to make, you know, the interaction of departments easier and to, to, uh, to work with customers and have better customer experience. And after millions of dollars and, and, hundreds of thousands of hours of, of time, it, it all seemed to collapse because it just doesn't work. Is that as common as it seems to be? It's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's extremely common, especially in today's time. Um, I love some of the things you said in your introduction, some of the insights you had just having gone through the book. Uh, it, look, for the, for the last 50 or so years since, you know, technology as we know it today kind of came to the fore. Businesses and people have been using it to solve process problems, which is great. We've been, you know, we've had unbelievable blessings as a society, able to do things and get things and have things that we couldn't have dreamed of 100 years ago. But we've been creating a problem the whole time. We've been creating, and you kind of pointed it out, we've been creating these 
these uh, silos where people tend to be more uh, sheltered from other people and instead are much more technology centric in the things that they do. And the reason we're failing so often nowadays is because most organizations have realized that we've really gotten a lot of the value out of technology for process automation that we can, and that's what we've been focusing on. And instead they're starting to realize if we can use technology to be more people centric, to create better engagement among our employees, to create better experiences for our customers, that's really one of the last frontiers of really differentiating and becoming more proficient as businesses. The problem is they're doing that the way that they've used technology to solve process issues in the past. And it's not working. It's failing something like 60% of the time. And there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that says 60% failure is actually a lot lower than the actual failure rate. Most companies fail on these kinds of projects two, three, four times before they either give up or they get it right. Look, I, I think it was Einstein, smart guy, who said we can't solve problems using the same approach we used when we created them. And technology has created the people problems that organizations have today. And they're trying to solve those problems by throwing technology at it the same way they always have. And there's a lot of frustration, a lot of money wasted, and even worse problems with relationships as a result. You, you use the analogy or the case study of, of Wells Fargo at the outset of the conversation. Look, a great case in point. I, I used to work uh, as an employee of, um, of that bank in, in, the, in the distant past, and they're known for having a lot of integrity. They've got a lot of controls around the things they want to do. And I don't know all the ins and outs of what happened there, but I follow the news, and I suspect that part of what happened is something began to take on a life of its own on the front lines, and there was this gap between what people were doing in the front lines of the organization and what the top of the shop thought was going on. And there wasn't enough communication. There wasn't enough connectivity between executives and the front lines. If they had the right level of employee engagement, they could have potentially deferred that whole issue. So yes, focusing on things like compliance and process to make sure that specific problem never happens again, those are important things to do. But if you lose the human touch, if you lose the human element, and when you're in an organization of 1,000 people or 300,000 people, it's really hard to keep that up. So if we get this right, we can actually say these, these things that have always worked in human relationships from, for thousands of years can actually be scaled just like other things can be scaled so that one person or one small group of people can have a relationship at a broader, more people and deeper more insights from those people level than they could have before. But we're losing some of that by trying to overly technologize this and we're losing some of the core principles of it. Does that make sense? It does. And I think one of the things that I want to make sure and, and I understand, and I think a lot of people would like to understand, is that you know after millions of dollars have been spent on these systems and they fail, uh, there's going to be a blame somewhere. Someone's going to, there's no way that this is going to end without a blame. It's one of the first things that the pe people look for. So if you go in and you, um, you know, come in when it's all, you know, it's rubble, the thing has collapsed, it has failed. Do you often find, or, or what, what do you find more commonly? Is it that the the system has failed because a lot of these CRM systems are sold as the, the, you know, the magic bullet that, you know, this system is going to, you know, it can, it can do everything. And I think companies think that it, that means that the system will do it for them. So is it the, that the, the, the system doesn't work or is it that the human element has failed to implement the system or use the system to its uh, capacity or, or to its potential? So you've, you've put the question very well because you said some of these systems, and they're not just CRM systems, they're systems even around internal communications too, like intranets and those kinds of things that are, as you said, I think you said sold as the silver bullet, that it's going to cure all these problems. That's the beginning of the problem right there. There is no silver bullet. This, for companies to really do this well, they really need to transform some pieces of how they think and how they do business. And so, you know, when you think of a transformation, think of a caterpillar going to a butterfly, right? We all want to go from an ugly, slow caterpillar to a beautiful, agile butterfly. But that happens in a series of small incremental steps to get to that transformation. What companies are being sold is an easy button. If you push this button, you'll be more connected to the customers. 
I can tell you having most of the business we do is actually rescue projects, helping companies that are in a state of failure, trying to figure out, pick up the pieces, get the train back on the tracks and move forward again. And most of it is because they bought this system as an easy button. The problem is most of them don't learn those lessons either. The other problem they have is more of a leadership problem where they continue to say, well, that piece of technology didn't work. So let's buy a different piece of technology to try to solve this problem. It's kind of like me on the personal side. Uh, my wife got me a Fitbit a couple of years ago. She's a personal trainer, and I kind of got the message that, you know, it's time for me to get in a little bit better of a shape. And uh, I like technology, and I like people, and so I had these visions of I'd use this, and it would really connect me with a healthier lifestyle. And what I found was after about three months, I kind of burnt out because the Fitbit kept telling me that I was doing the wrong things or wasn't doing enough of the right things. And uh, I just kind of took it off my wrist and, and stopped using the thing. So I'd expected to buy technology and it would transform me. What happened instead was my wife, who's uh, loving but also a drill sergeant, stayed on me and gradually made changes in my lifestyle, small things about how I ate, small things about how I exercised. And gradually, through a series of incremental steps, I transformed. She took the role of leadership in my life, and I've, I've shaved off about 20 pounds uh, over two years, and I've sustained it. Unlike a quick easy button diet where I go crazy for 30 days and then fall off a wagon, I sustained it. Businesses need to do that too, but most leaders don't know how to lead a project focused on transforming the organization to be more people centric. They get the tools, but they don't know how to use it as a leadership tool. So, um, so it's partly the expectations on the front end and how it's sold and partly how the project is led, whether it's from a project planning standpoint all the way down to a designing processes that are more people-centric instead of processes that are operational-centric and overly complicated. Well, I, I'll tell you, you, you've done a, a wonderful job of breaking it down and not making it um, overly complicated. And one of the things with your book, The Luck Principle, is uh, you realize very early on that, that it's not a technology book. It really is what you you know call people-centric. And you actually tell the story in this kind of parable uh, format uh, that is really interesting and really entertaining. Uh, it, and it's a level of, we're speaking on technology where it's not condescending, but it is very understandable. So, so thanks for noticing that. So uh, I guess the easiest way to think about it is, is, as I looked at it, one of the things I and, and the team I managed here realized after spending a lot of years looking at this is technology isn't really the problem and technology really isn't the solution. And so a lot of companies think they need to throw technology at it. And when it doesn't work, they think they need to throw new or more or different technology at it. So part of the inspiration was saying, we need to get away from that a little bit. And I'm not saying that technology doesn't play a role. We're living in more and more of a digital world where the digital and the physical workplace and world are intersecting. We've got to embrace the right technology. But, uh, but the problems that we're having usually uh, aren't going to be solved by just upgrading or getting new technology. It has more to do with people and process and how we're thinking about things. So that was one piece of it. The other way I looked at it was there are so many books in the marketplace on this topic now. If you do a search on Amazon or something for customer experience or employee engagement or journey mapping or something like that, you'll find dozens of books. And if you if you get some of those, most of them are very long. They're very some of them are extremely technical. Others are very extremely textbooky, And it, it makes it a really overly complicated subject for many people to approach. Even the ones that aren't purely technology tend to have just way more information than you need for an executive or somebody who's trying to get their head around this to get the broad strokes, to get the big picture of, look, here are the four or five disciplines or habits that if we can just understand these, and think about those whenever we're thinking about how we're treating each other or our customers will absolutely transform how we do business. So, so I kind of looked at all those books and said, we need to get something, you know, it's a nice short coast to coast type of read, easy to digest and can explain the core concepts in a way that's engaging. People remember stories better, but that's also relevant. So we augmented that even with infographics and statistics uh, so that people could look at it and not just say, this sounds like a good idea, but we'll also see the statistical evidence backing that up. You, you brought something up earlier that I want to make sure and um, 
and talk about is that your company, you say you oftentimes come in uh, at the at the end when a project has failed or, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing kind of the, the rubble of of a failed project. You know, cures always sell better than prevention, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what's the advantage that someone has of, you know, speaking with someone like you before they jump right in and start building this. Do you, do you see that the problems begin uh, at the beginning, middle, end of, of this project or imp- uh, implementation? My guess it's probably some very key decisions at the beginning that set this on a bad course all the way through. Yep, yeah, you're right on with that. If you think of it, um, it's, it's almost the beginning and end or where the problems are because we focus the least amount of attention on those. Now, most organizations, when they think about these, they think, Oh, this is a big technology project. So let's spend a lot of time on the front end choosing technology, and then we'll kind of implement it with a lot of technical resources and focus there. And then we'll kind of move on. And they just haven't really set up a good plan. They don't really understand what they're getting into on the front end. So the seeds for failure are kind of laid there. And then on the back end, they don't have the ongoing discipline to stick with it. I I love the Fitbit analogy because it fits really well here. And that's the idea of lasting change doesn't come because you execute a project. Lasting change because you actually put disciplines into your life or put disciplines into your company to consistently continue to do these things you've decided to do in a way that includes accountability and measurement and tracking and improvement and those kinds of things. So you're absolutely right that um, that that the seeds for failure are laid at the beginning, but they they actually don't often bloom into a full fledged problem until the very end of the project. And look, I it, it's easy for me to kind of say as a guy who consults with this that um, you know, we're perfect. And and the reality is there was a lot of humbling, vulnerable, exposed moments that led us to ultimately becoming the kind of company we became and doing this book. We'd, we'd implemented projects like this in the past, earlier in our history, we're celebrating our 15th year now. We thought we were great. Our clients generally liked us when we finished projects. Uh, they gave us good reviews and we saw the fail statistics were already out there and we thought we must be doing better than most. But when we look back in hindsight, when we checked our rearview mirror on some of those projects, we realized our results aren't much better than what everyone else is producing out there. So we had to ask a lot of hard questions and be very open to, we're part of the problem if we don't really understand what this is all about. And it kind of left, led us to uh, navel gaze for a while and to really kind of explore this and say, what's really going on behind this thing? So that brought us to becoming a whole different type of company. When people engage us up front, they kind of say that we're the sales prevention committee because we'll usually go in and do an executive briefing with a leadership team and we'll start telling them all the reasons why they shouldn't do this right now. Um, and we're not, we're not trying to unsell them, but what we're trying to do is say, look, to be successful, this is a different level of commitment. You think as executives, your role is to stroke a check. That's the easiest part of your job. That's the cheapest part of your job with this. Your job as an executive is to actually lead this project and change the way your organization thinks, lead by example. And, uh, and there's some practical ways that they can do that. It doesn't have to become their new full-time job, but it has to be integrated in what they're already doing. So most leaders don't know how to lead using digital tools. But if they don't learn how to lead with those, they're really just waiting for a millennial to replace them someday because these tools will absolutely change the foundations of how companies work once a leader embraces them. You know, you you said something uh, about how people seem to jump into the technology up front, right? That, that that's mm-hmm. what they kind of focus on. Uh, and it, it made me think and recognize how many times that because obviously the, the the these a lot of these systems they have salespeople out there selling these systems. And mm-hmm. and oftentimes it seems like that. Hey, here's a well, here's this great uh, system that we should buy. Let's let's find some problems for it to solve, rather than right. rather than hey, you know, we have this real problem. Then let's go find a system that can solve this problem. And and it seems that when you start with the technology, the the people in a company that are involved in that decision from the beginning are maybe the executive level, and then maybe the IT group. Right, that, that it's almost mm-hmm. uh, silent there. How important is it to even to, to not even talk about technology up front? To just talk about the problem and talk about the issues. To bring people in that maybe have no technology 
um, you know, accountability or, or reliance in the company. You, you bring in your customer relationship folks. You bring in your, um, you know, your mid management uh, folks to to decide what the problem is before you even start uh, talking about technology. I guess at what level uh, are you looking for input from employees and customers, or what should people be looking at from employees and customers before they begin to even decide what type of technology they should be looking at? Great, great question and an insightful analogy on the front end of that. The, the analogy is when you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so organizations get a beautiful demo of technology from a talented sales rep up front and then wind up having their IT people walking around the shop with a hammer in their hand, trying to pound every screw into the floorboards that they can. Feel excuse the extending the analogy a little bit far there. So, so you're absolutely right that a definition of the problem is really, really critical. And you don't define the problem generally at the top of the shop. Usually leadership has the least insight into the problems that the front lines of the organization are dealing with. And and let's face it, when we're talking about customer relationships and employee relationships, the vast majority of those are happening pretty far from the executive suite. Uh, there, you know, if you think of the pyramid scheme, the people that most of the employees in the company are near the bottom of that pyramid, and those are the people that are actually touching the customers most frequently too. So ultimately, to do this right, you want to get a group of the right stakeholders in the room, and those stakeholders are generally frontline people who are touching the customer every day and whose jobs are the ones that you really want to make more effective. I wouldn't even necessarily say more productive or faster because when it comes to customer relationships, that's not always the right metric, but you want to make them better at what they're doing. You want to make them able to handle more relationships at a deeper level than they could if they weren't using the tools to do this. The other the other group of constituents you want to get involved that almost everyone forgets is customers. I mean, we're, we're doing these things to ultimately, we all exist. Every business exists to serve a customer. And all of these tools, whether it's for employee engagement or customer relationships, they're really about making it better for the customer so the customer will want to come back, be more loyal, buy more, refer you to other people, and those kinds of things. I I think probably 1% of the projects that I've been asked to come into have ever even looked at the customer relationship on the front end of the project. One interesting thing is we actually just sat in a focus group with a bunch of folks who are customer-facing and some of their managers And it was an employee engagement project. It was more about how can we better share information internally. And so we started brainstorming. We say, what do you need to do? What do you need to find to do your job better? The number one and number two priority answers both had to do with we got to find the information we need to serve the customer faster than we can right now. Even though this project had nothing to do with customer management, ultimately it did have to do with customer management because employees engage not because they get great benefits, not because they've got a great manager, not because they get paid well, they like all those things, but really they engage when they have a voice in making the business better and improving the experience for the customer. So those are the people who you need to talk to and give a voice to have input into creating a more people-centric workplace. Yeah, and I think uh, (laughs) that really comes down to the core of the the book uh, is, is, you know, we're evolving into this, world of technology how important and critical human input and human element is to um, make that technology work to make it do what it um it, that it really needs to do so i i'd like to ask you if it's a, the luck principle the book l-u-c-k it's capitalized go to the background of what that means when you, you say luck sure so, so the idea behind luck and the luck principle is these are five, and there's a fifth one there that's not in the acronym that I'll talk about in a minute. These are five things that are actually core to human relationships in general. And, and I wish I could say that I was a genius and I discovered these on my own, but it was really in trying to solve these problems with technology and these projects that weren't working well and looking at how companies that were succeeding were doing things differently from those who weren't. And we found these, we initially found these four things that made them different. And as we backed away and looked at that at 50,000 feet, we realized, you know what, these are the same four things that any good relationship builder does to develop relationships one-on-one. 
the, the winners and companies have just figured out how to take those things and make them operate at scale so they can do that with more customers and more employees at a more meaningful level than the people who can't. So the four things are, look, everyone starts good relationships by listening, right? It's all built on a foundation of listening, listening and kind of remembering what people tell you. In a business, that's called a corporate memory. You've got to have a way to kind of say all these things that are being said inside and outside of the company. How do we listen to that? How do we capture that in a meaningful way? And Stephen Covey is the one who said, look, our problem as is, is a human species is not that we don't listen at all. It's that we listen with the intent to reply rather than with the intent to understand. So that's the second thing that great connectors have always done is they said, I don't just listen to somebody and then kind of when they shut up, I tell them what I want to say. I actually listen to them carefully, listen actively, and really want to understand what's their context, what's their situation. And companies, the word for that is big data. It's analytics. It's those kinds of things. It's, it's predictive modeling and machine learning, all of those kinds of things. By taking all that data that you've listened to and remembered, you can now analyze it. IBM did some research a couple of years ago with something like 1,200 uh, global CEOs, and they found the biggest difference between the fastest growing companies and everyone else was their ability to capture, extract insights from, and apply information to make better decisions within the organization. So that's understand is the you. And the third part is connecting. And everyone thinks, oh, okay, I understand that. Connecting is where the action is. But when you really break it down, most people are getting the action wrong because they look at connecting as something that use, is just a skill set. And make no mistake, personality is an important part of creating great connections. But when you look at the best connectors in the world, those people who go to a party and by the time they've drifted through the room from one side to the other, have 10 new best friends, those folks, although they make it look natural, they've practice habits over a lifetime. And when you look in organizations, the word for habit is process. But people processes are very different from operational processes. They're a lot more flexible, but they've got some rigid components too. So the C is connecting, and it's sort of the process step. And then the last step, the K, is knowing what the results are. So again, the best connectors in the world, they don't, they don't develop skills and then rest on their laurels when they hit 21 years old, they're constantly refining, they're constantly fine tuning, they're trying new ways of connecting with people, seeing what the world gives back to them, either on an individual or a collective basis, and continuously learn and improve. And companies that are doing gr a great job with relationships are doing the same thing. The problem is, it's easy to talk about continuous learning, you got to give everybody a scoreboard if you're going to learn continuously. And most companies have a big scoreboard. Think of a football field, there's a big scoreboard up front. Everyone can see revenue and profit and a few key metrics. But most people in most companies, in fact, 84% of managers say they don't have the statistics they need to help measure individual contribution. So in most organizations, people don't really know how they're contributing to that big scoreboard number. But if you look at a football team, the players on that team, every one of them has their own two or three metrics that they're trying to drive. They know if they can do their job impacting those metrics, it's going to ultimately have an impact on that big scoreboard that everyone looks at. In corporate America, corporate anywhere, most people don't know what their individual metrics are. And then the other thing you've got to do is you've got to collaborate. Knowing is a collaborating step, the working together step. Uh, you've got to be able to have a fail-safe culture where people can talk about what they've done that's worked, but more importantly, what they've done that doesn't work. And most organizations are not a safe place to be vulnerable and talk about what's not working. We'd rather talk about successes. If you've ever heard Brene Brown, she has some great TED Talks and has written some great books. She talks about vulnerability in the workplace. And I love one of her quotes that I heard from her once. She said, if you want to have a great organization, vulnerability is a prerequisite for kickassery. So this idea of saying, how do we give everyone a voice in looking at success and failure together and recognize that the best ideas often come from unexpected places? That's where innovation is going to come from. That has to do with meeting cadence and metrics and a lot of things that aren't necessarily all that technical. So listen, understand, connect, and know. That's the luck principle. There's this fifth one that we ran into uh, a few years after we developed the luck principle. And it was because we saw some companies really get it and run with it. And other companies, although they seem to try, they always seem to struggle with a little bit more. And uh, again, it's one of these things where one of our clients was our greatest teacher. We were in their, we were in their boardroom 
And during a little break uh, from our brainstorming session, we were kind of talking about how these guys really get it. They're, we can almost like not even hold them back. They're chomping at the bit. And we looked and there was a mission statement on the wall. And that's true in a lot of organizations. But we looked at their mission statement and it was an extremely people-centric mission statement. Um, it had a little bit about profits and financials, almost as an aside. It talked about our customers and their customers and the end consumers. They were a manufacturer that sold something and ultimately found its way to the consumer. Even their vendors and suppliers and employees were all in there as core stakeholders that they existed to serve. And we thought that was interesting. We did a lot of research on it. And we found that that whole idea of culture and integrity and a people-centric sense of purpose absolutely plays a role. So the way we kind of define it is luck is what you do. You can, you can do that in a manipulative bad way, or you can do it in an authentic good way, either at an individual or a corporate level. Good luck is who you are. So good luck isn't necessarily what you do. It's the reason why you do it. And so folks who already have that in their DNA or who transform their culture to put that in their DNA, they're the ones who actually have the greatest level of success with adopting this idea of the luck principle. You know what you just what you just kind of unfolded there is, uh, I think, uh, a perfect example of uh, one why what you're doing is going to change uh, the way a lot of people are doing business, the way a lot of people are implementing technology. But also, it it, it it's also an example of 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 the book, the the whole luck, luck principle book is. You know, when you open it up and you're expecting uh, it to be a technology. A book to a certain extent, but when you have uh, just uh, tremendous doses of of sociology, of, of anthropology, uh, you get lessons in all of this when it comes to the corporate world and human behavior uh, that I think all of us will recognize from our day to day um, world. And I think even if you have nothing to do with technology, even if uh, um, you know that you're not in the IT department, you don't even have anything to do with those decisions. Uh, I think. Uh, someone should read this and, and realize that they do have valuable input uh, to those decisions. And, and I, it really is just a, just a remarkable uh, read once you start getting into it and realizing the, the, the variables and the insights and the different ways that this affects the uh, success or, or you know, more importantly, the failure of these types of, of projects. So I got to thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for, for coming on today and um, sharing this information with us. Well, thank you. Yeah, change always starts with one person. And oftentimes, in fact, most oftentimes, that person does not start at the top of the shop. So every single person who reads this can play a role in making our workplaces better. Well, there it is, folks. You definitely need to check it out. The Luck Principle, Business Results at the Intersection of People and Profits. Uh, Jeff, if folks want to find out more about uh, you, uh, C5 Insight, and to uh, uh, get a copy of the book, how can they do that? So um, the book's easy. Just go into Amazon.com. I think it's on some other online booksellers, too, and you can search for The Luck Principle. You'll, you'll find it right there. You can also go to theluckprinciple.com. That's a site just for the book, and that'll link you to it if you want to go there and look at it. My company, C5 Insight, uh, you can get to that website at the letter C, the number five, the word insight.com, and you can learn a little bit more about what we do. We also try to bring this into everyone's reach, although most of our business is around consulting and advisory services. We do workshops on this too. So if you say, look, I just I need a couple of day dose to dive deeper into this, go to successaccelerators.com and you can see some upcoming workshops that we have on the topic. And you can also, I'll, I'll start publishing this out there, but I speak all over the world on this subject, usually two or three times a month. Um, so if you'd like to try to go to one of the events I'll be speaking at, you can certainly contact me. I know your website will have some of my contact information on it. I'll publish that on there as well, but um, I love to speak on it. And it's interesting. As soon as you get vulnerable and talk about, uh, employee engagement and how hard that is and, uh, and unsuccessful projects, it usually quickly turns into a support group where many other people are circling around sharing stories and helping each other. I love to see that happen. 
Yeah, well, I think this is something that a lot of people would be will be relieved and probably somewhat shocked at how unalone they are in in in, <laughs> in uh, these issues. So, uh, Jeff, once again, thanks so much for uh, uh, coming on the show, folks. Definitely, uh, again, it's the luck principle. Business results at the intersection of people and profits. We'll have a link uh, to the uh, book on Amazon on the show post as well as uh, the other links that uh, Jeff mentioned and how how to get a hold of and follow Jeff until next time on influencers radio. Remember you are the only real game changer. You've been listening to influencers radio to get all past shows and updates on future shows. Visit influencersradio.com today or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash influencers radio.